Tonight, I'd like to introduce Lisa Messick. She is the New Jersey Coalition's Director at Convention of the States. She's a real estate agent at Keller Williams Realty Metropolitan, and her affiliations include North Central New Jersey Association of Realtors, Girl Scouts of Northern New Jersey, Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary Church, and Convention of the States Project. Welcome, Lisa Messick. Constitution instructor for the IOTC, the Institute on the Constitution. Several hundred of us have taken that course. Uh, he is the inventor of a combination ocean wave energy converting electric power plant. Imagine that. Ocean wave energy converting. Yeah, it sounds pretty cool. Uh, and an electric self-charging ship. Mr. Boyce has been the owner operator of Delmont Sawmill for over 30 years. Now, before we begin the debate, I would like to introduce a very, very special young man that if you've been here before, you all know him. His name is Luke Zirkin Boyce. He's recited the yeah, the Bill of Rights, and tonight, there he is, he's going to recite Article 5. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution, or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, or on the application, or on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the several states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments. Shall call a convention for proposing amendments. <laughs> which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution when ratified by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states or by conventions of three-fourths thereof as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress. him to stutter through that. <laughs> okay, before we begin, I just want to explain something. Organizations on the pro side of a convention say this, the founders knew the federal government might one day become drunk with the abuses of power. The most important check to this power is Article 5. Article 5 gives states the power to call a convention for the purpose of proposing amendments to the Constitution. By calling a convention of the states, we can stop the federal spending and debt spree, the power grabs of the federal courts, and other misuses of federal power. The current situation is precisely what the founders feared, and they gave us a solution we have a duty to use. That's the pro side of the convention. Those against the convention state that they are opposed to a call for a modern day convention and seeks to work through Congress for constitutional amendments rather than through the state legislatures to amend the U.S. Constitution. Many view a convention as a quick way to pass amendments and they think we'll stop the big government juggernaut. Why would politicians suddenly start following an amended constitution after ignoring and violating the Constitution for so long? The remedy so desperately needed to return our country to good government is to enforce the Constitution, not amend it. So we have the pro side and the against side. And may we begin. You each have five minutes for opening remarks, and we will start with Lisa. Thank you, Brenda. Yes, I, I do support the Convention of States, uh, which is also called an Article 5 Convention, not a Constitutional Convention. Flip, so I'm not forgetting anything. Um, you can't hear me? All the way up? There you go. Work? Okay, thank you, Brenda. Okay, again, as I said, I support a convention of states, also known as an Article 5 convention. This is emphatically not a constitutional convention. Let me open with a quote from C.S. Lewis. Sorry about that. Flipping around here. 
Of all the tyrannies, a tyranny exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It may be better to live under robber barons than under omnipotent moral busybodies. The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep. His, son, his cupidity may at some point be satiated. But those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. When the framers added provision for amending our Constitution, it was for exactly the situation that we're finding ourselves in now. They feared that the despotism of power would begin to corrupt them. So we say what, it, they, what they said was, what is it if Congress is the problem? We can't count on Congress to propose the reforms that are necessary to fix it. The Article 5 provision included the essential backup to protect the republic they were, they were creating. That backup is the state legislators coming together on a single subject to help fix this problem. <clears throat> uh, this debate and the Article 5 debates that are happening all across America are far more serious than just two people getting in front of a mic and expressing their differing opinions. What's at stake here is our sacred United States Constitution. Yes, I did say sacred. The legislatures of 50 states are the jurors. The Constitution is on trial. But in this room tonight, you represent we the people. You are the jury. Our Constitution, which has secured our God-given rights for over 225 years, has thereby enabled individual Americans to produce more technological breakthroughs, send out more Christian missionaries to reach distant peoples with the gospel of Christ, and create more wealth in goods and services in our short history than all the other nations of the world combined throughout history. But our Constitution stands accused of being incompetent and therefore the cause of our federal government now trampling our God-given rights and selling our children, our grandchildren, and all future generations of Americans into economic bondage. If found guilty, our sacred constitution, they'll call Lady Liberty, will be put on the Article 5 operating table. Who the delegated surgeons will be, and what ectomies they will perform on her Bill of Rights, only God knows. Perhaps that is why God has put in my heart to defend her before you, the jury, tonight. As jurors, you have a solemn responsibility to weigh the evidence carefully, to discern between what is circumstantial evidence, opinion, and hearsay from what is historically reliable, factual, and conclusive. The prosecution will no doubt recite many abuses of our rights by the federal government, such as a $17 trillion debt, Obamacare, legisl uh, judges legislating from the bench, the president legislating by executive order, etc., etc. The defense agrees and would add to the list failing to secure our borders, involving us in undeclared wars, destroying America's industrial base and energy independence with unbearable regulations, debasing our currency, etc., etc. These are all problems we all agree on that we have. <coughs> Pointing to such problems, the prosecution will contend that amending the Constitution through the proposed Convention of the States is our only recourse to rein in our abusive, irresponsible government. The defense will show, however, each of these crises are not caused by any fault in the Constitution, but rather result from the direct violations of the clear provisions already in the Constitution. Yes. The prosecution will contend, prosecution will contend that the Convention of the States is not an Article 5 convention, which as for Article 5 requires resolutions from two-thirds of the states to cause Congress to call a convention for proposing amendments. No, it is just a convention to be called by Congress to amend the Constitution as per Article 5's requirement of resolutions from two-thirds of the states. Ladies and gentlemen, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. The Constitutional Convention. Again, if the jury finds that the fault lies in the Constitution, an Article 5 convention will put Lady Liberty on the Article 5 operating table. 
Who will be the delegated surgeons to get to operate on Lady Liberty? And what that means will they perform on our Bill of Rights? It is anybody's guess. But having not fell off the Garden State turnip truck yesterday, I would guess that Steve Sweeney will play a large role in selecting who those delegates are going to be. Thank you very much. You'll be, you'll be assured by the prosecution that the convention of the states will be a limited convention run by the states themselves. But I will show you how the text of the Constitution itself clearly states otherwise. You'll be assured by the prosecution that there is no chance of the convention becoming a runaway like the other constitutional convention, the only other constitution in America's history in 1787, which not only scrapped the document to be amended, replaced it altogether, but then even changed the rules for the new document's ratification. The defense will read to you words of, of the defense will read to you the words of Supreme Court Chief Justice Warren E. Berger, who is the o who's only one of many constitutional scholars who say that by its very nature, an Article 5 convention can have no such limits or safeguards and cannot be stopped once convened. The prosecution will assure you that their convention of states puts the Constitution in no danger of structural changes. But the defense will let you hear Michael Farris, the national director of the Convention of States Project, saying in his own voice that that is exactly what they want. That referring to the federal government, quote, we don't need a change of personnel, we need a change of structure, end quote. You'll be told by the prosecution that there are foolproof safeguards put in place such as the ratification requirements and the federal courts. The defense will point out how the states already, on the average, receive 35% of their budgets from grants from the federal government. 45 states of the 50 have already signed on to Common Core, sight unseen, to get on the federal gravy train. All right, Mr. Boyce, it's five minutes. Five minutes. We got to stop right there. We got to prepare. We'll Lady Liberty is not the villain; she's the victim here. Thank you very much. Uh, the first question, the question we have, is those promoting um, a constitution of the states contend that it is not a constitutional convention and therefore can be limited to only what the states' resolutions. Um, while those uh, opposing the Constitution or the Convention of the States contend that the Constitutional Convention as such can not be limited. Can each of you explain the reasons uh, of, for your positions and what you see as the possible outcome of such events and how would the United States Constitution be affected? So let's uh, start with Lisa. To repeat what you just said, those promoting a convention of states contend that is not a constitutional convention, and that is exactly right. <clears throat> we contend that it is not. It is only limited to what is in the state's resolutions. All it can do is propose ideas, <coughs> amendments, on how to fix the broken system, which has been corrupted by Congress. I strongly support the state legislators that have realized that it is time to act outside the usual process which is Congress proposing amendments itself, and are involved in creating a movement necessary to call for a convention of states. This will give people who refuse to be dependent or rely upon the corruption of, of uh, Washington an opportunity to fix it. I heard an appropriate analogy recently. What we need to recognize is that Washington can be described as an addict. We, the people, need to set up the intervention. We need to give Washington a chance to legislate in a way that we can be proud of. The 1787 Conven Constitutional Convention was suggested by the Annapolis Convention of 1786 to render the federal constitution adequate to the exigency of the Union. This was very broad language that was obviously not limiting itself to amendments. The Articles of Confederation were not sufficient to maintain our government. In fact, 10 of the 12 state delegations in Philadelphia had this broad authority. They reported back to their respective states. For example, New York sent three representatives. Alexander Hamilton was a Federalist and state. The other two, fearing that they did not have that broad authority, which was in fact accurate, New York did not believe in this, they were very strong anti-federalists, 
<clears throat> so the other two went home. Alexander Hamilton did not take it upon himself to submit a vote. He realized that he was still responsible to his state and that he would have to answer to them. In number 40 of the Federalist Papers, Madison discusses the extremes the delegates went to so they could adhere to their charge as representatives to their state. This was emphatically not a runaway convention. Okay. What do they see as a possible outcome of this event and how would it be affected? What we need to understand is convention of states cannot be a partisan issue. For example, let's just assume that someone proposes a crazy amendment of doing away with the Second Amendment. We have 27 double red states, which means that the Republicans control both the House and the Senate. Excuse me, both houses. Uh, we have 17 double blue states. We would need 13 of those states to block any crazy amendments that might have sneaked through a convention of states. Now, if you can't find 13 states to block something, then what you need to realize is maybe it's not such a crazy amendment because it obviously has the support of the entire country. That's not a very popular idea, but what you need to understand is this cannot be limited to the Tea Party. It can't be limited to the Republican Party. Because I can guarantee you that if an amendment happens, a proposed amendment happens to sneak through, it will not be ratified. This will be the best way to raise money for the Democratic Party because people are going to be running in the other direction. Hmm? All right, Peter Boyce, say you have uh, the same question in five minutes. As I said, you'll be assured that we can rely on the state legislatures not to ratify anything that would infringe on our God-given rights. Right. It would take 38 state legislatures to ratify the, or 13 to stand up against it. Is that 13 of the five that didn't sign on for Common Core, sign on seat to get the federal money? Most states on the average receive 35% of their budgets from, the, from federal grants. Are they going to all of a sudden shut that spigot off? No, they're going to send the delegates to the convention with the mandate, bring home more bacon, not less. I'd like to read from Supreme Court Chief Justice Warren E. Berger. This is in response to a letter from Phyllis Schlafly, the founder of Legal Forum, who I had the privilege of testifying alongside in 1993 when the bill was pending in Trenton. We were two states away from, from a convention being triggered then. And she asked him, can a convention be limited to a single issue such as a balanced budget amendment? This is his answer. I have also, quote, I have also repeatedly given my opinion that there is no effective way to limit or muzzle the actions of a constitutional convention. And this is a constitutional convention. The convention can make its own rules and set its own agenda. Congress might try to limit the convention to one amendment or to one issue, but there is no way to assure that the convention would obey. Now, this is a Supreme Court Chief Justice. After a convention is convened, it will be too late to stop the convention if we don't like its agenda. The meeting in 1787 ignored the limit placed by the Confederation Congress, quote, for the sole and express purpose, meaning the sole and express purpose of just revising and amending the Articles of Confederation which is what the Convention of States says they want to do. They just want to make some amendments. With George Washington as chairman, they were able to deliberate in total secrecy with no press coverage and no leaks. A constitutional convention today would be a free-for-all for special interest groups, television coverage, and press speculation. Our 1787 Constitution was referred to by several of its authors as a miracle. Whatever gain might be hoped for from a new constitutional convention could not be worth the risks involved. A new convention could plunge our nation into constitutional confusion and confrontation at every turn with no assurance that focus would be on the subject needing attention. I have discouraged the idea of a constitutional convention. I am glad to see states rescinding their provision through their previous re resolutions requesting a convention. In these bicentennial years, we should be celebrating its long life, not challenging its very existence. Whatever 
may need repair and our Constitution can be dealt with by specific amendments. The prosecution has said that the founders said that Article 5 was put there for just such a time as this. Wrong. They put it there to correct errors. Correct errors that Congress might not want to correct. The founders weren't stupid. They knew that a runaway government that ignores the Constitution, that tramples the Constitution, that violates their oath of office, that by amending the Constitution, that could have no more effect of reining them in than amending the Ten Commandments would stop liars from lying, thieves from stealing, and Bill Clinton from doing what he does. <laughs> the problem is not the Constitution. The problem is in the hearts of those that we elect and the ones that they appoint. We need a revival in America, a revival of morality, we need a revival of Americanism, an understanding of the principles we're founded on, and an obedience to the Ten Commandments. We need to rein ourselves in, and we need to be more vigilant and responsible to who we elect and hold them accountable. I'd like to read, if I have time, Patrick Henry. So much for not being, so much for not being a runaway convention. In fact, Mike Ferris, the chairman of the Convention of the States, has said anyone that says that the delegates exceeded their authority is an enemy of the Constitution. Listen to Patrick Henry. I would make this inquiry about those worthy characters who composed a part of the late federal convention. I have the highest veneration for those gentlemen, but sir, give me leave to demand, what right have they to say, we the people? Who authorized them to speak the language of we the people instead of we the states? The people gave them no power to use their name. That they exceeded their power is perfectly clear. The federal convention ought to have amended the old system. For this purpose, they were solely delegated. The object of their mission extended to no other considerations. The head of the Convention of the State Project has called Patrick Henry an enemy of the Constitution. The, now, the next question that I have, uh, and we'll start with this, what proposed amendments, Lisa, uh, do you see that we could implement that would prevent the corruption that we've experienced so far to this point? In other words, the fact that uh, the way we got to this point at the, at the now is that they were not reliant or, or in, in alignment with the Constitution. So what could we add, or what do you see as an additional way or, or an amendment to the Constitution that would prevent this? The Convention of States movement is calling for amendments to limit the federal government. Now obviously this is never going to come from Congress. Congress will never self-regulate itself. For example, can you possibly see that Congress would vote on term limits? It's never going to happen. Would you imagine that they would do away with their lifelong pensions? It's never going to happen. So the, the amendments that we're proposing, or that will be up for discussion, because we can't say that now, because otherwise we're not going to have an application that will follow the process for a convention of states. We are calling for an amendment to limit the federal government. Now, once that happens, once the Convention of States is called, those are the only things that can be discussed. We can't discuss anything that's going to touch the Second Amendment. We're not going to touch Roe versus Wade. We're not going to, those cannot be discussed. It has to be things that are limiting the federal government. Okay, just saying, generally limiting the government. Just how? Well, I just gave you two examples. Uh, term limits for Congress. Um, uh, the other one was, um, <laughs> yes. um, you know, that, that's not what we're, we're discussing right now, only because, you know, this is going to come from a bipartisan effort. Um, someone might have a better idea. There might be better ideas out there, which you cannot have if you're limiting it to one person's ideas. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Peter, same question. What uh, proposed amendments would you see coming down the road that would actually prevent uh, corruption? Well, you can bet it's going to be bipartisan because Wolfpack left this group, been pressuring state legislators in New Jersey, and sure enough, they got one to introduce a resolution calling for an Article 5 convention. Now, Wolfpack, if you don't know, is funded by George Soros. So here's a group that's already pushing for an Article 5 convention. 
There also, there's a new constitution waiting in the wings called the New States Constitution. It was produced at the cost of $25 million provided by the Ford Foundation over the course of 10 years. They're going to want to be part of this convention. There's another constitution already been drafted by the Revolutionary Communist Party of the United States. <coughs> They'll be waiting in the wings. There are hundreds of leftist groups that are on record as supporting a constitutional convention, an Article 5 constitutional convention, to say that, oh, they're just this convention of the states, and it's going to limit it. The prosecution will not be able to point to one issue, one, one item in the Constitution or in any other official document that says it can be limited to a single issue. A convention by its nature, by its definition, the delegates are vested with sovereignty, they're given a blank check. I lost my trend of thought. Uh, how many time, how much time do I have left? One minute. Okay, you're gonna get James Madison, the father of the Constitution. My computer, James Madison. You wish to know my sentiments on the project of another general convention. I shall give them to you with great frankness. If a general convention were to take place for the avowed and sole purpose of revising the Constitution, it would naturally consider itself as having a greater latitude than the Congress appointed to administer and support as well as to amend the system. It would consequently give greater agitation to the public mind, an election into it would be recorded by the most violent partisans on both sides. It would probably consist of the most heterogeneous characters, would be the very focus of that flame which already too much heated the men of all parties, would no doubt contain individuals of insidious views who under the mask of seeking alterations popular in some parts but inadmissible in other parts of the Union, might have a dangerous opportunity of sapping the very foundations of the fabric. Under all these circumstances, it seems scarcely presumable that the deliberations can be conducted in a positive, I just lost it on the computer, can be conducted. In the end, if I said, I should tremble for the result of a second convention. In this, in this present temper in America. That was the father of the Constitution. He's saying he would tremble in the present temper of America. That was 1787. God fearing men that just fought off the British, the great President Secretary. He couldn't imagine what it would be like today. It would be a special interest, major media, free for all. Be a Thank short you, feeding frenzy on our Bill of Rights. There you go. Thank you. Now we're talking about the Convention of the States versus the Constitutional Convention. And on Lisa's side, she says this is a Convention of the States limited to which issues? Just the amendment of? Specifically, the Convention of States project is calling to limit the federal government. So any amendments that would apply underneath that umbrella. Well, that would be just the one event, the one resolution, and that's all they attend to. As, I, as you understand it. As I said, what this would be would be a convention called on a single subject, which is limiting the federal government. Any amendments proposed would have to limit the federal government. Okay, but there could be dozens that could limit the federal government. Correct. All of which, that, some of which that we have uh, could be altered. Freedom of speech, for example. Is that possible? Well, considering um, the Feinstein right now believes that the only thing, the only person who that should apply to are bona fide reporters that have been credentialed by the government. She said it. So she's already saying that now. What would make you think that this would, would that the Convention of States would want to change that? That 38 states would actually sign on to so, something so ridiculous. But it's possible. No, I would not say it's possible. You would have to have 38 states say Feinstein is correct, that only reporters should that apply to. It's never going to happen. And Peter, you of course are on the side that says if this opens up, this will be automatically, or will become, and is, a constitutional convention. Yes, Congress, I would say, the indication is, oh, the, the states will control this convention. I'd like to call an expert witness. Get Constitution. Get Constitution. What does... Article 1, Section 8 empowers Congress for all the things that it's empowered to do, okay? and what laws it can make. Kid Constitution, what does Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph 22 say? 
to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution. The foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States. You can do it. Or in any department or officer thereof. The point is, Congress is authorized to make all laws necessary to carry out the functions that has been delegated. Calling a convention under Article 5, that's one of the powers delegated. They will make all the rules. You can bet they will, down to every detail, they would make the rules controlling the convention. And he who sets the rules determines the outcome of the convention. They will not give up power easily. Ultimately, it will be challenged and go to the Supreme Court. Right? Any groups that are trying to be cut out. How about Planned Parenthood? They want to be in there. How about Nambler? They want to be in there. How about uh, Gender 21 people? They want to be in there. So when it goes to the Supreme Court, who's going to hear it? The same court that rules to take the Ten Commandments off the classroom walls across America when they've been stolen and changed their city into the Ten Commandments? The gave us no way. We're going to put the Constitution into their hands. All right, sir, thank you. All right, we have a question here. Uh, when we analyze the writings of the Founding Fathers, we find a divine spirit in the works leading to the Constitution. Those who oppose the Constitutional Convention are concerned that that spirit of the document will be replaced. Can each of you discuss the re relevance of God's influence as the Constitution exists today and possibly on the for the future? First part of the question again. When we analyze the writings of the Founding Fathers, we find a divine spirit in the, work, the works leading to the Constitution. Constitution. Uh, those who oppose the Constitution Convention are concerned that the spirit of the document will be replaced. Uh, can each of you discuss the relevance of God's influence as the Constitution exists today and the future? Okay, for how it uh, is today, I mean, it's pretty obvious that no one's paying attention to that. In fact, a lot of people think that, you know, that's not really what they meant. They'll quote, um, I believe it's, I believe they'll say it's Jefferson that didn't believe in God. Um, so they, they will find a way of, of going against that anyway. Um, it's something that would, kind of goes along with that. Jefferson wrote Madison in March of 1789 that the tyranny of the legislature is the most formidable dread at present and will be for long years. That of the executive will come its turn, but it will be at a remote period. So, I mean, I would say that they, they did have some uh, idea of things that could happen. Um, are you going to say that it's divine intervention? I don't know. Um, I would say that there's a lot of conservative groups that happen to also be Christian or in other way, believe in God. So I would say that you will, you will see at a convention of states a microcosm of society. There will be some liberals, there will be some extremely conservative people, there will be Tea Party, libertarians, constitutionalists, there will be people who are atheists. So I would say that you should expect to see everybody, and that's what you should want to see. This is not just, yes you do. This is a country that, in, that includes everyone. And if you think that you could possibly change anything in this country by applying your idea is just one group of people. It's never going to pass, nothing's going to change, and you will see this country go down. All right, thank you very much, Peter. John Quincy Adams, our sixth president, my favorite for this quote, he said, the highest glory of the revolution was this. It combined in one insoluble bond the principles of civil government with the principles of Christianity. John Adams said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. I can go on and on, but I'm going to run out of time. There was a question earlier that I didn't really accurately answer, and that was about what amendments or what have you. Article 1, Section 8 empowers Congress with certain specific things. If they would simply obey Article 1, Section 8, spending would be reduced by 80%. No need for a balanced budget amendment, just obey what's there. Article 3, Section 2, empowers Congress 
to limit the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Right? At any time, these so-called pro-life congressmen can rein in the Supreme Court and say, no, you're not going to hear any cases on abortion, we're going to return to the states where pro-life groups can fight it on a level playing field. Article 4, Section 4 requires the federal government to protect the states against invasion. 20 or 30 million illegals crossing our border, that constitutes an invasion. All they need to do is obey what's there. But in order for them to obey what's there, we've got to hold their feet to the fire. Yeah. They've got to know that we know what we're talking about and we're not going to take baloney for an answer. Amen. We want them to obey and honor their oath of office. Amen. We already have term limits. We can, if we don't like Congressman Lobiondo, we can vote him out every two years and vote the next guy out. Just term limits aren't going to do it. Supreme Court judges, judges, they rule for life so long as they have on good behavior. When Ruth Bader Ginsburg was asked by an Egyptian leader about their new constitution, I've got a, a video here of it, a new constitution, what should the template be? She said, well, I wouldn't look to the United States Constitution. I'd look to the South African Constitution. That's poor behavior. She should be out of there. So the provisions are there. Yeah. The country can be turned back around and be on a throat of prosperity like it used to be if it's obeyed. The problem is it needs to be obeyed, not changed. Right. Yeah. Not put on the operating table, just obey it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, what other individuals or groups that you know of uh, support or oppose the Article 5 Convention? Well, as Peter uh, stated, there are, there are people who you wouldn't particularly want to be supporting such a thing. Okay, that's fine. That's fine that they support it, because what they're doing is exercising one of the rights that we have in our Constitution. Do you honestly think, honestly, I mean, if, say somebody proposes something crazy, do you honestly think that someone is going to be able to convince seven, 38 states to ratify that? Yes. 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 Let me ask you a question. Do you realize that the Equal Rights Amendment almost didn't pass? Would you, would you want to keep that? Of course you would want to keep that. Uh, what what amendment covers that Equal Rights Amendment? Yeah, really. Where is that in the Constitution? <laughs> I'm sorry, can you educate me, please? Excuse me? What amendment number is the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution? Okay, and yes, I'm going to flip through a book and look at it to make sure I'm actually staying the correct it one. So while you're looking for that, how about I ask uh, to Peter to answer that? And then, uh, again, Peter, what other groups or uh, individuals do you know of that support or oppose the Article 5 Constitution? I've got a list here of literally hundreds of groups on the left. Literally hundreds. Code, code, just to name a couple off the top of my head, Code Pink. National Lawyers Guild, which is basically affiliated with the ACLU and so on. On and on, of course, the revolutionary communists, uh, the uh, Communist Party of the USA, uh, George Soros group, this wolf pack, and this pack. And again, they're behind the possibility of, of creating an amendment or amendments that will control the constant to control the government. Once it's triggered, once it's triggered, who are the delegates going to be, and what's the agenda going to be? Going to be whoever's popular, wherever, wherever the money flow is coming from. That's going to be determining the, the agenda. Let me read. There is an answer to the problems. And the, the reason that all of a sudden this Convention of the States is growing momentum and receiving this push from these media personalities is because nullification was working. Nullification started being used back when the northern states were nullifying the fugitive slave laws, refusing to return the slaves to the southern states. More recently, the Real ID Act. So many states nullified that, the federal government just gave up on it. 
Montana has nullified the federal gun laws, and any federal agents coming to Montana try to exercise the federal gun laws on our people, we'll arrest them, we'll put them in jail. And on and on. Nullification is working, and that's why now there's a big push that's, oh, we need a convention. All right, thank you. Uh, Lisa, did you find what you were looking for? Uh, no, but I was just, just going to make a comment as far as nullification. Obviously, the only the only thing that has really worked as far as the application was the repeal of the prohibition, which I obviously required an amendment to do that. They didn't straighten up. No, the prohibition was repealed. First of all, I'd like to say pro prohibition, right? Prohibition was enacted as a result of the normal amendment process, and it was ratified by the states which also ratified the 16th Amendment, the 17th Amendment, so to rely on state legislatures to watch out for our God-given rights. The history is there, they can't do it. They, they're, they're not knowledgeable the way the founding fathers were. They can't do it. I'll read about nullification. This is Thomas Jefferson, the man that drafted the Declaration of Independence. In cases of an abuse of delegated powers, which is what we have, the members of the general government being chosen by the people, a change by the people would be the constitutional remedy. Throw the ones out. But, where powers are assumed which have not been delegated, which is what we have now, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy, and then he explains what that is, and that the co-states recurring to their natural right in cases not made federal will concur in declaring these acts void and of no force, and will each take measures of its own for providing that neither these acts nor any others of the general government, not plainly and intentionally authorized by the Constitution, meaning in Article 1, Section 8, shall be, exercised, shall be exercised within their respective territories. The New Jersey, can, if the New Jersey legislators have a backbone, they can stand up and say to the federal government, you're not going to institute any federal gun laws in our state. You're not going to do Obamacare, not many. And an increasingly number of states are nullifying Obamacare. There's a solution. For the states to have a backbone. There's a contract between the states and the federal government. When the federal government violates that contract, who do we look to? The Supreme Court? That's part of the federal government. No, the states. The states recover their natural state, their natural power. All right, thank you. Okay. okay, let me just make something clear. Okay, the Convention of States does not disagree with nullification in and of itself, okay? We, we support all efforts to rein in the public federal government, but they're not mutually exclusive. History doesn't suggest that these mechanisms will be successful, okay? Um, people argue the Constitution has enumerated powers. The powers are not specifically granted to the federal government, are exclusively reserved um, by the Constitution and Tenth Amendment to the states. The Congress acts outside of the actions are unconstitutional. The states have a duty of render such acts null and void. But however, nullification, uh, as suggested by history, rarely works to cancel out big, big ticket issues. The South could not nullify the federal government's abolition of slavery, but desegregation of schools, the reapportionment of the legislatures, even though it tried. Nullification hasn't stopped so far, and there's no reason it's going to stop Obamacare, for example. No. The best example of this, as I said, was the repeal of prohibition. Um, let's see here. Article 5 does not expressly address or controls the scope of the color of convention process, then under the nullifier's argument, the power is expressly reserved to the states. You can't have it both ways. It does remain a powerful and necessary tool, but we still need to show Congress and the rest of the government that we're serious. The only way to do that, as shown by history, is a convention of states. All right, how about, um, we'll provide opportunity for Peter to ask Lisa a question, Lisa to ask Peter a question, and we'll wrap this up. Okay, so let's go for Lisa, ask Peter a question, and we'll start out that way. Okay. Okay, you're saying that this is still too risky, that Convention of States has never been done before, it's not the time to take a big risk. Well, what I say is that the founders met in Philadelphia in 1776 to sign the Declaration of Independence. The risks were much higher, 
They didn't have all the answers. They were taking on the strongest military in the world. They played the pledge of their lives, their fortunes, and everything else to save this country from continued oppressive government. Why do you consider that this is more risky today than it was back then? For example, at this point we're spending ourselves into bankruptcy. We will never be able to pay this off. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, 100 years ago, when he was trying to bankroll World War I, borrowed $30 million. We still have not paid it back. So you're saying, just by forcing them to do what, will do what. As I see, nothing has changed, nothing will change, until they, the Congress sees that the states are bound together to force them to do something. The only way to do this, legally, is to call a convention of states. You will need 34 states to call it on a single issue. If some random group decides to sit there and say, we want to propose a resolution to amend the Constitution, we want a, a balanced budget, we want you guys to behave the way you should. The term limits, no one refers to those because you know how this works. People see the same old names, even in my county, Rodney Feeling Heisen, this family has been involved in politics for, since God was a boy. Okay? So Nothing's going to change. So my, my point is, why do you consider this so risky when there is nothing else that's going to change this? Okay, well, I'll answer your questions from the beginning with regards to the men that pledged their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor. Many of them gave their lives. What they did, they nullified King George's laws and stood up and refused to obey them. And that was our revolution. And after we had our revolution, we formed, well, what got us through the revolution was the Articles of Confederation, which were too weak as far as the central government. But the states were very protective of their sovereignty. They didn't want a strong central government. But they recognized they needed something a little bit stronger, therefore, to correct the exigencies in the Articles of Confederation. So they sent the delegates theirs just to revise and amend. But the thing to understand is the delegates to a convention and yes, it is a constitutional convention. There is no other venue for, not, for a constitutional convention than Article 5 and two-thirds of the state legislatures. That is the venue. It is an Article 5. It is a constitutional convention. Well, the delegates to, to a constitutional convention are just sort of a sovereignty. There's no force less than God on earth to stop them. And they took that power and they did what they needed to do. If that power were placed in men's hands today, we can only imagine what would happen. It would be the end of our constitution. What was the second half of your question? <laughs> okay, so why is it risky? Why is it risky? In other words, what, why? what is it risk right now? Why is it so risky in, in, in today versus... One thing, right, one thing right off the top, okay? Trade promotion authority is pending in Congress, right? Granting the President trade promotion authority. So he could, he could fast track this... Uh, Atlantic traffic, I always get the names right. Atlantic, Atlantic trade, trade treaty, one with the European Union. It's like a NAFTA merging economically America with the European Union, the bankrupt of the European Union, and also merging America with the Pacific Rim, right? To bring that together. Certainly the powerful forces behind the scenes aren't see our constitution as a, a pesky stumbling block. They want to get rid of it. We need to be harmonized with the other nations of the world so we can be comfortably merged into their world government. It's naive to think otherwise. We've got to be a little streetwise here. We can't be naive and think, oh, it's just, uh, just going to limit it to, to reign in the federal government. Congress isn't going to go along with it. And big bucks are going to come out to make sure that their power is increased. All right. Uh, do you have a question to ask uh, Lisa? Or yeah, show me. One quote from any founder, you could take as long as you like within the time limit, that says that Article 5 was put in there to rein in an abusive federal government, or that ignores the limits of the Constitution. Because it's not there. Okay. I'm going to bring up something that's very close to that, because unfortunately I don't have Wi-Fi and I can't pull up those quotes. Um, Jefferson, from, from the notes on the state of Virginia, in 1781-2, an elective despotism was not the government we fought for. 
Jefferson also denounced the concentration of power in the Virginia legislature under the Constitution, which wasn't really the Constitution for them. All the powers of government, legislative, executive, judiciary, result to the legislative body. The concentration of these in the same hands is precisely the definition of despotic government. There will be no alleviation that these powers will be exercised by a plurality of hands and not by a single one. 173 despots would surely be as oppressive as one, but those who doubt it turn their eyes on the Republic of Venice. For example, their constitutional convention, and that's what it was at that time, their the constitutional convention, it does have very broad powers. It is supposed to form a constitution. A convention of states was meant to amend it, not each other. The aim was to create a sound system. Those people in question felt for the first time secure and confident that they would be protected. And the reason that they were protected, as of from George Mason, was because they added that Article 5. And the, the, the part of that component was specifically the Convention of States. The anti-federalists did not believe that what they were doing was going to work unless they had something that would allow them to call a convention. For example, um, the Washington Conference Convention of 1861, I believe, was meant to be a peace conference to try to keep the slave states from seceding. It obviously didn't work, but that was a, that was a convention of states. It didn't change our constitution. They were trying to amend it. All right. Uh, we have uh, each of you give me two minutes to close, and then we're all finished. So, ladies first, Lisa, we got a two minute close. Before we finish with closing remarks, I just want, first of all, to thank everyone for being here tonight. But after having what you've heard tonight, you have a choice. If you believe that we should have a convention of the states, please. Come see Lisa afterwards. She will tell you what you can do to get involved with that. If you believe that if it is not something you want to see happen, please see Jerry in the back, and she will tell you what you can do. There are things back there that we can sign for the legislators. So I, I want to leave you with that before we get to closing remarks. Okay. The difference between a republic and a democracy, for example, is a democracy, and unfortunately some people are throwing this word around along with the Constitutional Convention, is a rule by a non-independent democracy. The, the individual and any groups of individuals composing a minority have no protection against the unlimited power of the majority. Power is absolute and unlimited. Decisions are unappealed, unappealable under the legal system that is established which is basically the situation that we have now, do you not agree? Congress is not listening. The judicial branch just uh, interprets our con Constitution. They are not adhering to it. This opens the door of an unlimited tyranny by a majority. This is what the framers of the U.S. Constitution meant in debates in the Constitution Convention when they riled against the excesses of democracy and abuses under any democracy of unalienable rights of the individual by the majority. For example, immediately post-1776, legislatures of the same sub of some states behaved as if they were omnipotent. No effective state constitutions to limit the legislatures because most were acting under the acts of the respective legislators. That would mislabel constitutions. Strangely enough, neither the governors nor the courts were able to exercise any substantial influence in defense of individual and alien rights, which is why the states at that point had called a convention of states, which became the Constitutional Convention. We have to understand, this, is, this was the convention of states. The states wanted this. Some people didn't believe that that was the way to go. They wanted to retain that stuff in the states of themselves. But most obviously came around and decided that this is the only way that they could stay together. All right, Lisa, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And two minutes for you, sir. Thank you, first of all, I want to thank Lisa for coming out and for the video.
Uh, I'd like to call Barack Obama to the stand. <laughs> Can you hear that? No. Barack Obama said, we are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Barack Obama said, we are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Now what would it take to fundamentally transform the United States of America? It would change a, take a change of structure in our Constitution, away from being a republic, the rule of laws. Now here's Michael Ferris, the head of the Convention of the States Project. I'm hoping you can hear this. Did you hear that? Yeah. Not a change of personnel, I meaning those in Washington, they're fine. Microphone. Not a change of personnel, those in Washington are fine. We need a change of structure. That's what this is about. It's about powerful people behind the scenes trying to get their hands on the United States Constitution. John Quincy Adams, the highest glory of the American Revolution was this. It combined in one indissoluble bond the principles of civil government with the principles of Christianity. That's what we're about to lose. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Peter. Um, like I said, if you agree with Lisa, please see her afterwards. If you don't, please see Jerry. And uh, I really appreciate it. If you have any questions, I'm sure they'll be here for a little bit, but Lisa came all the way from like right outside of New York, so she can't stay too long. And thank you again, and we'll see you next week.